So about today's session, um, we have a, a fascinating topic to discuss today, actually. Um, it's the second time we're looking into this topic. We, we did um, just over a year ago. Um, perhaps there's been some progress and things have moved on a little since then. Um, and it's perhaps a topic that is somewhat overlooked, um, perhaps something that we should have more conversations about. Um, because today, today we're going to be looking at gender reassignment and its implications on hospital services and, and more specifically for us, um, transfusion services. And there does seem to be um, a lack of central guidance on this topic, uh, but we're fortunate today to have a speaker who has been actively working on this in their trust um, and been doing some good work that they're going to share with us today. So um, I'm going to welcome Sam. Sam is a registered biomedical scientist. And Sam's the lead transfusion practitioner at the St. Helens and Nausea Teaching Hospitals. Um, and Sam joins us today to share some of the insights and experience that, that Sam has had um, and, 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 and share some of the problems and, and challenges that, that they face and anticipate facing in the, in the future around looking at some of the ideas and solutions that will help us to uh, develop systems um, to, to, to safe and inclusive systems for everybody who comes into our care. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to welcome Sam to uh, take over control and uh, lead today's discussion. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Danny. Um, thanks everyone for joining today. Um, yeah, so my name's Sam Bonney and as Danny said, I'm the lead transfusion practitioner for St Helens and Nosley Teaching Hospitals. Um, this trust also provides the pathology services for Southport and Ormskirk hospitals as well. Um, we're soon to be merged, but at the moment we're still two trusts. So trying to navigate um, policies and procedures for two hospitals is just extra fun and games as well. Um, so before we begin, I would just like to say thanks to Alex. Um, as Danny mentioned, um, I first kind of got intrigued in this topic when I read in Bloodlines an article that Alex had put together. And then she also did a talk at this group as well about this subject. and. I could just really relate to it. Everything she was saying, like, yes, this is what I'm seeing. These are the problems we're having. Why is there no answers? And kind of made it my job then to try and engage and actively look for a solution to this. So I'm hoping to now carry on that conversation. You know, I have spoken to Alex about it, and hopefully by having you guys here today, um, we can try and make a difference. So thanks to Alex, thanks to Danny for inviting me because like say there's over 100 people here today and hopefully um, by getting people to engage and talk about this topic, we will make a difference. Um, and lastly, thanks for all joining me. So quickly, I'll just uh, cover what we're going to I'm going to discuss today. We're going to try and um, define gender and the certain pronouns and um, language used when we're looking at, at gender. The laws and regulations that are in place currently in the UK to guide us. We're going to define what the problem is in healthcare and then more specifically um, what the problems are with relation to blood transfusion. We're going to look at the policies um, that we have locally and obviously they're guided by national guidelines or sometimes not guided because of the lack, um, as you will see throughout this presentation. And lastly, going to try and have a look at how we can work together to try and fix this problem. So firstly, I think we need to break through the binary. We need to um, remember that gender is, is no longer to be thought of as, as a binary, um, male or female anymore. Um, so it is a very tough subject to navigate. And I think that's what scares people sometimes. We do often use terminology wrong in healthcare environments, sometimes um, with the best intention. People don't always know what the right thing to do is or the right thing to say. Language is often inconsistent as well. Um, and as I say, healthcare professionals, we do want to do the right thing. It's just that sometimes we don't know what the right thing is. And this is because there is a general lack of education and clear guidance with some aspects of this topic. So not all the aspects, um, but certain aspects of the topic we need to do more. And I think lastly as well, um, whose job is it to fix it? And I think that's why we are lacking in, in a way to move forward because it's so multifactorial and so multidisciplinary that people don't want to touch it and they're thinking that maybe else somebody else will fix it. But at the end of the day, I think we need to be vocal, we need to speak out and we need to be uh, to drive that change. So let's explore this really interesting topic a little bit more. Um, when Alex 
and um, an article in Bloodlines, and um, she shared this really interesting um, picture infographic from um, it was called the gen genderbed.org. And you can, if you go to genderbed.org, you'll see this there and also some other really useful information. Um, it's by Sam Killerman, who has um, given permission to share their stuff. Um, it's so it's uncopyrighted, so you can nick that and use it as much as you want, not just to educate your uh, your peers, but I also found it useful to educate, you know, my, my teenager um, and my husband who works in A&E because there is such a, you know, a knowledge gap sometimes and a reluctance to, to engage in the subject because we don't know sometimes what language to use. So this genderbed person is about looking at gender um, and trying to understand um, what all these words are in, and language used. So please have a look at that. As I say, I won't be able to go into it in a lot of detail today, but two of the things that are in this genderbed on the website are definitions of biological sex and a definition of gender identity. So what is biological sex? So this is the physical sex characteristics that you're born with and develop, including your genitalia, your body shape, your voice pitch, body hair, hormones and chromosomes. So um, it's, it's, it's objectively measurable hormones and, or, and organs that you possess. Um, but in reality, it can be um, harder and more complex than that. For example, someone can be born with the appearance of being male, but then they could have functional female reproductive systems inside. Um, in the examples on the right in the little purple squares, um, you will see intersex. So that is a label for somebody who has both male and female characteristics. And you also see in this bottom right purple box, um, these self identification labels. So this represents people who possess both male and female characteristics, but they choose to identify with one of the binary sexes. Okay. Gender identity, though, I think this is what's more important now. Um, so gender identity is all about how you think about yourself. As you know it, do you fit better into the societal role of a woman or a man? Or do neither of those ring particularly true for you? So that is, do you have aspects of your identity that align with elements of both? Or do you consider your gender to fall outside of the gender norm completely? And that answer is your gender identity. Um, it's been accepted that we form our gender identities at around the age of three and that after that age, it's incredibly difficult to change them. And formation of your identity is affected by hormones and the environment just as much as it is by your biological sex. Often problems arise when someone's assigned a gender based on their sex at birth that doesn't align with how they come to identify. And this is the problem that we're encountering now and why we need to move forward and before we're thinking about this problem. Examples of common gender identities that aren't listed also include agender, bigender, third gender and transgender. But like I say, we can um, um, view that a lot more if you go to the genderbed.org. And I think two um, things that we do need to be very familiar with are two terms is transgender and non-binary. So just to reiterate for those who might not be that familiar, transgender um, it's denoting or relating to a person whose sense of personal identity does not correspond with the gender assigned at birth. And this is the symbol, the pink and blue symbol. And then we also have non-binary, which describes any gender identity which does not fit with the binary of male or female. Is everyone, I've just seen somebody in the notes saying, are the slides moving, mine's not moving. Are we okay again? Yeah, the slides are moving some. Um, That's fine. Some individual problems which yeah. we'll fix for you. Thank you. You might remember during that crazy lockdown period getting um, the census and the post for you to fill in. Um, I know I remember getting it. And I think the information from the census in 2021 has highlighted that it's a much bigger problem than we probably all think it is. Um, so across England and Wales, we got responses from 45.7 million people. Um, and 93.5% answered yes, that their gender aligns with the sex assigned at birth. But 0.5% answered no to say that their gender identity was different from the sex assigned at birth. Um, some of them answered no, but didn't 
say what they identified as, but 0.1% identified as a trans man, so that's um, sign female at birth now living with a um, male identity, um, 0.1% identified as trans women, um, not point, point not 0.06 identified as non-binary, um, 0.04 votes in a different gender identity, and 6% didn't answer the question on gender identity at all, which makes you wonder if actually there's still a lot of confusion and people not fully understanding the subject or not understanding how they want to identify. So I think that shows that um, just looking at the um, this, the people who don't identify as the sex that they're assigned at birth, it's about one in 200, which means that in your average A&E department, at least one patient per day will have a gender that isn't the same as the sex assigned at birth. So it is bigger than we think. Um, and we are likely to encounter a patient every single day um, in our hospital setting. So we do need to think about it. Okay, so what happens if somebody decides that they want to change their gender identity? So patients can request to change this on their patient record. So their hospital, their, their um, records at any time, and they don't need to have had to undergo any form of gender reassignment, surgery or treatment to do that. So you can go to your GP and you can say you want to change your gender identity um, and that can happen um, straight away. At that point, then they'll be given a questionnaire to fill in. Um, this is all supported by Primary Care Support England. Um, so this is the, 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 the people who are responsible for, for helping GPs to write processes and guidelines. At that point, um, when they change the gender, they're given a brand new NHS number. Um, and they're registered as a brand new patient at that practice. Okay. Any information relating to the patient's previous identity should not be included in that new record. Okay. So we can see how problems can arise now. It's hard for GPs because they can carry over medical history, but they shouldn't be carrying over anything that would give away their transgender status or their previous identity. Okay. So this is where I think the problem arises. I'm just also um, going to go um, into a little bit of detail about two of the UK laws, which I think are really important when we want to understand this subject. The first one is the Gender Recognition Act from 2004. And what this says is um, it aims to safeguard the privacy of transgender people by defining information in relation to the gender recognition process as a protected characteristic. It's protected information. So anyone who acquires the information in an official capacity might be breaking the law if they disclose that information without the subject's consent. And that means even if it's for medical reasons. So protected information such as transgender status, it can only be disclosed to another health professional for medical purposes if you've got a reasonable belief that they have consented for that to be done. OK, so we should not be discussing this unless we know the patient has consented for us to do it. OK. The Equality Act 2010 as well is really important. So this makes it um, illegal for us to discriminate against because of gender reassignment. And gender reassignment means proposing to undergo, undergoing or having undergone any process to reassign your sex. So you don't have to have had any form of treatment or surgery. Um, you can just be um, proposing to do so. And also in 2020, there was an employment tribunal ruled um, it was Taylor versus Jaguar Land Rover, um, that the protected characteristic of gender reassignment includes people who identify as non-binary or gender fluid, so it's not just transgender patients. Um, in addition as well, this act also covers situations where a person is subject to gender reassignment discrimination because they are perceived as trans even though they aren't, or situations where a person is discriminated against because of their associating with a trans friend or family member as well. Um, so, and this means though that if we um, are discriminating against them, it might not be intentional, mm -hmm. it might be a one off incident, and it could be because of a rule or policy that we have got um, that is discriminatory against this group of people. So, I think for that reason, we need to have a look at our policies and make sure that our policies aim to provide the same level of care and safety and respect patients who have had gender reassignments to those who haven't. So we'll look now at the problems with healthcare and gender. 
there's three things I think that um, I, I feel I, I really uh, need to be made clear and understood. Number one is sex and gender are equally important. So sex stand at birth and gender identity. When I use those terms, that's what we're concerned with. OK, so firstly, why is sex assigned at birth important? So it's crucial in some situations. Most of you on this call today will work in blood transfusion and you probably are going, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, I know that, I know that. Um, we need to protect, now this isn't my words, this is from the BSH with the guidelines for compatibility procedures. We need to protect women of childbearing potential, um, but arguably, you know, it needs to be anyone who is capable of carrying a fetus. Um, we need to protect those people from developing red cell antibodies, which could cause the immunity disease of the fetus and newborn. So this includes female to male transitioning and non-binary individuals who may receive treatment for their gender dysphoria, but they might retain their childbearing potential. OK, so that's what's important for us. Um, and that's why we need to know sex assigned at birth. But also there's other reasons as well that you might not think of because it's not within your remit. But things like reference ranges for pathology tests as well that are affected by your sex that is assigned at birth. Um, so the ones I can think of are obviously testosterone and oestrogen can increase or decrease certain parameters such as your hematocrit, haemoglobin, creatinine, calcium, albumin, triglycerides and equally if someone is having gender reassignment treatment they might be taking testosterone or oestrogen which can similarly affect your, your, your lab results. Some drugs as well so you know someone might not be pregnant but they could conceive while they're on a medication so again Pharmacists need to know if someone um, is capable of being childbearing. Um, also, national screening programmes, you might identify as, as male, but if you've still got a cervix, you want to make sure that you've been invited for um, the national screening. And then the last one is risk calculators as well. So there's a lot of risk calculations done in the healthcare setting to work out risks of mortality or morbidity. And these are very often um, done from cisgender individuals, cisgender meaning people whose gender identity is the same as that assigned at birth. One that I can think of is the obstructive sleep apnea risk calculator. So anaesthetists use this to decide the level of post-operative care, um, but we could be getting a wrong risk um, because we're not looking at the right group of patients and we're not looking at the sex assigned at birth. Okay. But equally, yeah, sex assigned at birth is very important. But gender is just as important. Using correct pronouns is essential. We all know that it's essential. We must affirm the rights of all transgender and non-binary individuals to access healthcare and live their lives with dignity, including having their identity respected. And we must make every effort to use the correct pronouns and to not misgender patients. If we ever do misgender a patient, then we need to apologise immediately and then do our best that, to make sure we don't do it again. You know, people understand that we can make mistakes, but it's about learning from mistakes and making every effort possible not to do that again. When you look at the, Brit the British Medical Association, they say that all healthcare workers should receive training in trans and non-binary awareness as part of their education and training, and that they should seek awareness raising activities as part of their own CPD as well. OK. However. We know that this is still a problem. Although we're trying to do as much equality and diversity training as we can, and we're raising the subject, we know it's still an issue. There was a survey in 2018, um, and it captured information on trans and non-binary patients. And we found that a lot of them had had negative experiences when they were accessing healthcare. Um, so 40% of trans respondents um, said that they had a negative experience on the, um, at least once. Um, because of their agen gender identity, 21% of trans respondents reported that their specific needs had been ignored or not taken into account. 18% had avoided getting treatment altogether because they had fears of a negative reaction. Um, so we need to address these concerns because we need to provide high quality healthcare and reduce health inequalities, as well as ensuring that an inclusive healthcare system is free of discrimination for everybody. I think someone's put some questions in here now, uh, and I think hopefully I'll cover them um, in the in the following slides. But if not, I'll address them at the end of the talk. But hopefully I'll cover it in a minute. Okay. So we've established that 
sex and gender are both equally important. The second thing we need to say is sex and gender are not synonymous. They shouldn't be interchangeable. And somebody needs to go and tell IT this because this is where I feel the problem arises for transfusion. OK, so for this talk, I thought I'd go and have a look at some of the systems that we use on a day to day basis around our trusts. And when I took screenshots here, I've got a screenshot of our limb system. I've got a screenshot of the wristband, the compatibility label that is produced from our electronic blood tracking system, the electronic um, patient record, um, the care flow, which is where the hospital orders blood tests, and then the ICE system, which is the system that the GPs use to request blood tests. And we can see from this, but well, you might not be able to see very clearly from the tiny pictures, but some use sex and some use gender, yet that information is very often being pulled across. It's coded to populate the same field. It shouldn't be populated in the same field. It's not the same thing. So um, also IT guidelines are lacking and they promote this interchangeable use of sex and gender. Um, and also they only offer binary options as well for gender. They're not offering anything else other than male or female. So we still sit and wait for these IT guidelines to be updated. So the IT guidelines came out in 2014 and they should have been reviewed in 2017. Um, I have been informed that they're going to be out very soon. Um, but if you look through these IT guidelines, these are the, the transfusion um, guidelines for IT specifications. There's no mention of the importance of differentiating between sex assigned at birth and gender identity. They are almost 10 years old now. And as I say, the new ones are on the way. Um, but when we look again at what the BMA say, they say care must be taken when processing documentation where computer systems can populate sections of form with such data automatically. And we are doing that very often pulling through data automatically and we're pulling through gender to sex fields and vice versa. Glad to see somebody else using telepath. <laughs> yeah, this is true. OK, and the third thing I wanted to say is clinicians are actually following their guidance and they're trying the best. It's just that that guidance is very limited. OK, so. On this slide here, I've just taken a couple of quotes from the BMA guidance for inclusive care of trans and non-binary patients. And again, all the references are at the end of this presentation. So what they say are a gender, a person's gender history should not be divulged to anyone without their consent. Care needs to be taken around communications such as referrals to ensure that information that is relevant to the patient's ongoing care is retained. But that information then that may not, sorry, that may reveal a gender history and which is not of relevance to the current medical situation is not disclosed. A patient's gender history can be revealed in ways other than explicitly stating that a person is trans or non-binary. For example, listing, listing certain operations that I previously have done that don't match the current gender might make the patient's gender history clear to the reader, such as co uh, coposcopies and prostate surgeries. So I think sometimes when we in the lab are getting requests that say pre-op on them, they're telling us pre-op because they don't understand that sometimes the type of operation is important and also being able to gather um, a clear and full transfusion history is important and sometimes that necessitates us having to look at what the sex assigned at birth is and for the previous health record under the previous NHS number. So to say, I don't think clinicians are doing this out of ignorance. They're just trying to follow the guidelines. You can all imagine my excitement when um, in February of this year, a new um, article came out in the BJA. So that's the, the, the Journal of Anesthesia and um, its guidelines on the perioperative considerations for transgender and gender diverse adults. So it's a fantastic article. However, there's no mention of transfusion in the article whatsoever. So it's clear that still people are not understanding what the considerations are for transfusion and providing appropriate blood to people, especially those that can be um, childbearing potential. So I have wrote to the author and he agrees. And what we've said is we probably need to write something new about this problem and also especially about the coding um, in IT systems. 
and the problems with this interchangeable use of gender and sex. So watch this space. OK, so I think all this, um, this myth, the, the not understanding the difference between gender and sex and the interchangeable use and the lack of guidance and the lack of doctors and consultants not want to do the wrong thing. This is causing a lot of confusion and problems for us. OK. And ultimately, this is causing risks when they're given blood transfusions. It's risks of delays, it's risks of complaints and it's uh, risks of having incidents. OK. The first one I'm going to look at is um, wristbands and blood component mismatches. OK, so our wristbands have the gender on them. And obviously we don't want to misgender somebody. We want to have a wristband which has the gender identity on it. Um, so we might have a trans male who has male on their wristband. However, when it comes to the lab, they will scan that wristband to generate the label and then that group and screen will come to the lab. But if we do know that that patient is um, trans male and has got childbearing potential in telepath, our limb system, we actually co um, collect sex. So sex assigned at birth and we would input female for that. And the compatibility label on the blood would also have female on it. So now when they go to um, give the blood transfusion using the blood tracking system, we will get a mismatch. It will actually alarm and tell us that one of the demographics doesn't match. So what's correct? We don't want to misgender somebody, but we don't want to not provide blood based on the sex assigned at birth, um, especially when we've got childbearing potential. So how would you fix this in, this, in, in your lab? Would you change your wristband? Would you change the label? Would you just proceed anyway and ignore the mismatch? I don't know if anybody wants to add some comments in the um, in the comments section. Any ideas what you would do if you were faced with this situation? No. Yep. So yeah, I think it's a hard one. I think when we've been challenged with this, we wouldn't want to change the wristband because we certainly wouldn't misgender somebody. Um, but we can't change telepath because we've got certain algorithms that work based on the sex assigned at birth, like UK negative blood. Um, yeah, never ignore the mismatch. Um, isn't that breaking the law because it identifies trans status? It could be, uh, yes, exactly. And this is the problem. We need to make sure we know about consent. And again, I'll discuss this a little bit on the future slides as well. Um, because if we, if we haven't got consent for that, then it is breaking the law. If the patient has consented to it and for that to be stored in our limb system, then we can't. But this is the problem. The guidance is so, so grey. Um, so I think what we probably would do is just um, ignore the gender mismatch and proceed to give the blood transfusion. And again, something else we need to think about is this could cause a delay. This uncertainty, if a nurse rings you and says, it's giving me a mismatch, what's going on? That could cause a delay which again is going to be another shot incident, isn't it? Do new limbs need both gender? So gender can go on the label. I think so. I think we need a limb system that identifies sex assigned at birth and gender. And I also think we need wristbands that have QR codes on them. So there's not a visible um, sex assigned at birth on the wristband. It's not visible, but it's all encoded into a barcode. That possibly is the way forward. Yeah, the importance of this needs to be discussed with the patient on admission. Absolutely, it does. And this is the problem because doctors and clinicians don't understand enough about the implications in transfusion. I think if they did, then absolutely that discussion would happen. And this is why I think us as transfusion professionals need to make clinicians aware of it. And again, it's something we'll discuss in more detail in a minute. I've got a case study for you now. So this one is a 25 year old trans male having top surgery. Top surgery is a general term to describe an operation that changes the look of a trans person's chest. Um, so because breasts are associated with female bodies, trans men or people who were assigned to be female at birth might want to have their breasts removed or significantly reduced in size. Or on the other hand, trans women or people who were assigned to be male at birth but identify as more feminine can choose to have the have breast augmentation surgery to create a fuller figure. Um, so yeah, this patient came in to um, trans male to have top surgery to remove the breast tissue. Um, we weren't informed of that 
basically this patient's been given a new NHS number and a new record. We received two group and screen samples in the lab, which said mail on them because our request form just says MOF. Um, that was circled on the request form and the clinical details just said pre-op. Um, but actually the patient has retained their female reproductive anatomy. So what are the issues here? Is the doctor right not to disclose the operation info to us? Yeah, top also stands for termination of pregnancy. Yep, this could also cause lots of problems if we just had top wrote on the request form. Absolutely. Could there be assistance for trans patients to consent and have the risk explained to them about revealing their identity upon changing? Exactly. So this comment here by uh, Jemima, I think when the, the GPs have to do um, counselling with the patients when they want to change identity with their GP surgery, and they do do counselling and they go through different scenarios with them, like the screening programmes, for example. But I don't think tra um, transfusion is on the um, the radar. And again, maybe we need to do more education with the primary care providers because it is so, so important. Um, so, yeah, going back to this patient, they just wrote pre-op on there, probably because they get told in their BMA guidance not to disclose any information that isn't relevant. They probably don't think it is relevant. Um, because they don't understand the importance of somebody who has childbearing potential. Yeah, clinicians may not be aware that the, the patient has changed gender and how could, yeah, they might not be aware because the, the patient might choose not to disclose that. Um, and again, this goes back to letting the patient know when they transition, what the implications are. And then if they choose not to disclose it, that's the risk they take. And that's half, that if they're fine to do that, that's fine but they need to understand the risks. Okay. Exactly, they wouldn't receive K negative blood. Yep, and again, all these comments are valid and you will see another case study in a minute which shows when this has happened. Okay, this is another one. A 40 year old trans male having a hysterectomy. So there's no history on the, on the limb system in telepath in the lab. The request forms um, two sent again, two group and screens, they say male on them and they say pre-op. We process the group and screens and we find that the patient has an antibody. They have a Duffy A in their plasma. So we've got no transfusion history at all. The first thing we do is to call pre-op where the samples were obtained to find out the transfusion history, to find out what operation they're having so we can put blood on standby for them and find out what the date and time of that operation is. It's when we make that call that we find out that the patient's having a hysterectomy. Okay, so alarm bells are going here because obviously we've book them in as male on our system. Um, and at that point, the nurse um, discloses to us that the patient is transgender. They have a conversation with the patient and the patient um, is happy to disclose their previous name so that the lab can do a check on the limb system for a previous record. Um, the lab um, biomedical sciences then adds to the limb system and the patient's notes on both records um, the fact that the patient is transgender. So do we think the lab staff are right to add transgender to the record? And are they right to add that to both records? What do we think about that? Give people a minute to, to write. Not right. Probably not. Yes, it would save confusion. Yeah, and this is it. I don't think there is a right and wrong um, in terms of we're trying the best for the patient. We're trying to do the best thing for the patient to make sure we give them the right blood. Um, but the, the law says we should not disclose transgender status on any healthcare records without the patient's explicit consent. So I think we need to make sure first that the patient has consented to it. We have been informed by the nurse that the patient's consented, but is that written down somewhere? Do we need to see this written evidence? Maybe we do. It's a really, really tough subject. So I'm just going to look at some more comments as they come through. Yeah, having on the record cause a lot of distress. Need sex to be hidden in the background. Yep. Yeah. 
patient has agreed to sharing information, but do we need separate consent to record this information? Yes, exactly. This is a it's not just about disclosing the information, it's then we need consent on where that can be stored. And again, we'll discuss that a little bit um, further down. The third case study um, is a pregnant transgender male. So the antenatal booking bloods say male and there's no previous history whatsoever. So the first thing the lab do is interrogate the patient's record just to see, you know, is it a transgender patient? Have they just recorded the gender wrong? Or is it a partner and they're not actually pregnant? It's the partner who's pregnant. It could be anything. We see everything, don't we, in the lab? Um, but when they look on the electronic patient record, we do note that transgender is documented in the notes. There's no consent for that at all. It's just the word transgender, but we can't see any consent forms or anything. Um, the lab call the midwife at this point, and the midwife tells us that the patient has had three previous pregnancies when he identified as female, but no previous records are shared. So he's not consented to share that, that those records with us. Um, transgender status is not documented on the limb system. And we process the um, antenatal serology request and we find the patient is deemed negative. So my first question is, um, are we right to not um, document the transgender status on the limb system? Do we keep that sex in the limb system as male? What do we think? What are the comments for this? Statements such as patients of childbearing potential could be used instead. Limbs constraints may mean if it says a male on fire, pregnancy cannot be added. Absolutely. This is it. I mean, we could add some more childbearing potential, but again, certain rules um, are activated in our limb system by having the sex in as female. So if we put sex in as female and the birth date makes them less than 51 years of age, it would then give us a warning to make sure that we always give K-negative blood. Yeah, and then the second question is, uh, your patient's visa is negative. Is that going to cause you any problems in your lab? Issue of anti-D, absolutely, yeah. So does see Stuart's put that um, correct. So currently on our limb system, we are prevented from issuing anti-D um, to anyone who has got this, this sex in the system as male. Um, so we can't issue anti-D without changing that sex. Um, do we get rid of this rule? Do we have to go to the limbs provider and ask them to, to get rid of this so we can now issue anti-D? to somebody who's got mail in, but really telepath is asking for sex, not gender. So potentially we just need to put it in as female and issue the entity, but make a note somewhere that um, they are transgender. But it's the, it's, it's the consent for this and to store that information. But arguably, do we say that the, the very fact that the patient is identifying as male and is pregnant. Is that consent? The fact that they've turned up to an antenatal clinic appointment, pregnant, and identifying as male. Any issues about FMH estimation testing? Again, it's yeah, it's about issuing the anti-D. We could do the FMH test, but then um, it's it's issuing the anti-D afterwards once once we've got the results of the of the, the Clyhower test. Protocols would require to be added manually to male record that are automatically applied to female patients. Yeah. Okay. And the last case study I've got is um, a GI bleed in a 31-year-old trans male who retains his uterus and ovaries. So again, this was something we found out retrospectively. The patient was admitted to the emergency department with a severe GI bleed and was given the emergency or positive red cells, which is policy at our trust. So any um, patient assigned male at birth over the age of 18 or any patient assigned female at birth over the age of 51, in an emergency, we encourage the use of O positive red cells because we want to um, preserve the precious O negative units for those of childbearing potential. Um, during his stay, further routine blood components were issued. Um, 
all the request forms that came to us say mail on them. And like I say, we didn't give a um, check to see if we gave K negative units on um, or not. We, we didn't check the status of them. We only found out about this because we do um, review meetings on major hemorrhage activations. And that's when we learned of the transgender status. So again, would you change the sex and the limbs to female? And what else would you do? Is there anything else you would do um, once we know that we've given this patient O positive emergency blood and we have given them blood that wasn't K negative? Give anti D. Probably a bit late for the anti D now though, because I think it was a couple of weeks later once we've reviewed it. Discussion with patient by medical staff to explain the risk. Absolutely. Yeah, so the emergency O positive units will have been K negative. Um, but it's the other units afterwards that I had routinely on the ward that won't have been uh, necessarily K negative. Yeah, reporting to shot exactly. So we did. Um, we need to report this to shot um, as a incorrect blood component transfused um, and special requirements not met. Um, duty of candor, absolutely. We need to inform the patient what's happened. Um, request repeats to see if patient has become sensitized as well. In fact, I don't in this situation, I don't think this patient was actually um, o, o negative when we found out his blood group afterwards. So um, although we've talked about anti-D errors and things, um, it was the fact that we didn't even consider giving O negative because we, we didn't know that the patient was assigned female at birth or they didn't have that conversation in the emergency department. Um, the patient wasn't actually uh, rhesus neg D negative, so it wasn't a problem for the anti-D thinking about it. The previous patient was, but not this one. But they could have been, that's the issue, they could have been um, and it would have been too late because we'd already transfused the emergency blood to them. Um, how did the patient's transgender status get revealed? Was it by the patient? It was by um, one of the clinicians on the ward, um, so on the gastric ward later on, and it, it was in the notes, um, but it wasn't clear because no formal consent process had been done about this, about where the patient consented for the information to be shared and to be stored because we have got a lack of a, a policy to cover this and this is the issue we've got. Okay. So lastly now we're just going to look at what can we do to fix this problem? I think we all understand and we're all on the same page when we look at this problem. But how do we even begin to fix it? We'll put here, how is the lab to know? We go by what we are told and what is on the sample. Absolutely. And this is, brings me on nicely to what my first slide is in when we're looking at how to fix it. We need to train clinical staff. And so if I've got any transfusion practitioners um, on the call or anyone who's involved in clinical education and training, then I'm looking at you guys right now. Um, but we need to make them aware of the importance of, with the patient's documented consent, informing the transfusion lab of sex assigned at birth and gender identity, especially when these two differ. OK, we also need to make them aware of the importance of with the patient's documented consent. Taking and disclosing with us an accurate transfusion history, which may include disclosing a previous record under a different NHS number. And I think if clinicians understand that failure to establish as someone is got childbearing potential and failing to establish if somebody has got antibodies or special requirements under a previous health record, the implications to that are we would potentially miss clinically significant um, red cell antibodies, we might miss some special requirements and also it's the duplicate records as well. So again, most of you are probably familiar with the BSH guidelines and um, and how they hate having duplicate records in any limb system, especially in transfusion. But currently, we will have we'll have duplicate records for these patients. And um, we've got one under the, the first identity and then one under the, the identity once they've transitioned. What do we do about this? And it doesn't look like we can merge them because the GPs aren't merging them. They're saying we can copy 
relevant information over, but we're not to merge them, but that does lead to BSH guidelines. Um, and then that brings us on to, do we also need to make the GPs more informed of the issues as well? So when they are initially doing this transition um, questionnaire and counselling, if they understood the implications for blood transfusion, perhaps it could be included there and then the patients could make an informed decision if they ever come into hospital and possibly need a blood transfusion. Yeah, the information and risks need to be relayed to the patient at initial discussion about gender reassignments at the GPs. Yeah, and we've got six thumbs up to that. This is it, but we don't do any GP training at all. And I think we need to possibly look at this in the future. So yeah, the first thing we need to do is train clinical staff. And as I say, even if you just add one slide at the end of your training about um, gender identity, it could have a massive impact and at least people would know to who to come to if they've got any questions about gender reassignment or gender identity issues. The second thing we need to do is speak up to our IT providers. So when we talk about IT providers, the first people I'm talking about are the LIMS providers and our blood tracking, electronic blood tracking providers. We need to let them know that there's a problem and that they need to improve their systems to allow for inclusive care. So they need to have um, sex assigned at birth and gender identity as two separate entities. They cannot be interchangeable and they cannot be synonymous with each other. And I think the more noise we make, the more chance we've got of making a difference. I have flagged this up with both companies at the moment. And in fact, I flagged it up with them about three years ago and they're working on it. But I have not had a solution so far. But also, it's not just lab systems. This is your electronic health records as well, your care flows, your ICE systems, your, your GP requesting, your um, hospital um, requesting systems, your electronic patient records, all of these. So you need to raise concerns to your clinical informatics lead if sex and gender are synonymously used. We need to let them know that they can't be coding a gender from one system to be populated in the sex assigned at birth in another system. OK, so speaking up to IT people as well. The third people we need to go and um, have conversations with are our EDI leads, our Equality, Diversity and Inclusion leads about policies. Do you have a policy um, about caring for transgender patients in your trust? We do. Well, there's two trusts that I um, we provide a service for. One trust did and one trust only had one for, patient, for staff who transitioned but not patients. We've since shared that policy so both trusts have a policy on the harmonise. And it's a great policy in lots of ways. It's got lots of really useful information about, you know, care on the ward and giving them private um, um, bed, you know, um, rooms and things and giving them clinic appointments at the beginning of the day or the end of the day and what to do about toilets and uh, mixed sex accommodation and things like that. But there's absolutely nothing about record or consent at all. There's nothing in there. So we have flagged it up with them now. Um, and as I, people have been saying on this chat, I've been seeing the comments coming through, and I think most people seem to be in agreement that the way forward is we need to have a consent form for this purpose. The way I see it is we have two parts of this consent form. The first part of the consent form is consent to sharing their transgender status when it's medically relevant. And the second part of the form is do they consent to share their previous history when it's medically relevant? And if they are happy to share that, where are they happy to share it? Are they happy for it to be stored? And if they are happy for it to be stored, where can it be stored? Can it be stored on the limb system? Can it be stored in their pa patient record? Um, it's a tough subject. I have spoken to our EGI lead on this and her concern is that if we store that consent form in the patient's record, then that could be viewed by people who are not necessarily involved in, her, in their patient's care, such as clinical coding and audit departments. So it's not that straightforward. And because of this now, we've also got the legal team involved as well. Um, so it isn't easy, but the first thing you can do um, as in your role, whether you're a BMS, um, a clinician or a transfusion practitioner, is just speak out about it. Speak to your line manager and speak up if you see any health inequality or any discrimination because of processes that are in place. And, you know, add it to the risk register so that we can it can be there and people need to do something about it. I'll just read some of the comments. We had a meeting two days ago about this with our EDI teams, and I'd be grateful if you're willing to share your policy. Absolutely, I can do that, Stuart, afterwards. 
Um, to consent, they need to understand the risks, so patient information is key. We don't transfuse hopes witness if they are bleeding to death. Um, we respect their informed decision. Yeah, and that's it, but we'd only know this if we've got the consent forms. Challenging to achieve consent when you have blood bank and not clinically facing and reliant on clinical staff. Yeah, and this goes back to us needing to better educate the clinicians um, so that they can consent the patients. Okay. And the last two things I'd like to say, so we yeah, need to train and educate clinical staff, go and speak to our IT providers, speak to our EGI leads, raise incidents as well. So if you do have an incident um, where you've misgendered somebody or you're not happy how the gender's been recorded or you're, um, you're using gender and sex assigned at birth synonymously, put it on your dating system or your incident reporting system. All staff have a duty to report any incidents on their misses, regardless of the impact on the person. So it doesn't have to have caused any harm. Um, we need to learn from incidents in their misses so that we can improve our processes. It obviously, it also identifies where we need to focus resources to, to you know, maybe training to improve things. But I think the most important thing is if we report these incidents, they get then get uh, fed in to the national reporting and learning system so that then we can look at them a national problem. We're making more noise and we're making the problem be seen. Um, we need to report because it's a legal requirement as well. But as I say, we can look for trends and then for us, because we have put a few incidents on the um, data system, we now can put it on the risk register and we have to do something engaged to get this fixed. And the last thing to say is we need to report it to SHOT as well. A lot of these incidents might go to SHOT anyway because it's caused a delay. It's caused an incorrect blood component to be transfused or it's caused us to transfuse a component that hasn't met a special requirement. But even if none of those have happened, you haven't had an incident, it's been a name miss, SHOT is still interested. SHOT wants any unusual circumstances because sometimes these include specific learning points. And also, if we all start to report them to SHOT, I think SHOT will understand that it's not that unusual after all. And again, it might empower SHOT to make a difference and to help us to, um, to solve this problem. Okay. So in summary, um, four main things to say. Sex assigned at birth and gender identity are equally important in healthcare, particularly when it comes to blood transfusion, but they are not synonymous. The Equality Act and the Gender Recognition Act makes it a criminal offence to discriminate because of gender reassignment or to disclose someone's transgender status without explicit consent, even for medical purposes. National healthcare guidance is lacking and therefore so are our local policies and our, our processes. And I think this is especially relevant when it comes to IT and consent procedures. But we all have a duty to educate, to report and to speak out if we witness deficiencies in care relating to trans and non-binary patients. And this includes non-deliberate incidents, such as inadequate processes in the transfusion lab, which may cause us to treat trans and non-binary patients less safely than cisgender patients. And as promised, um, the references are here as well that I've been using throughout the talk. And if anyone has any questions, then please ask away and I hope you've enjoyed the, the presentation. Lovely, Sam. So we've got a hand up there. Malcolm. Can you hear me now? I can hear you, Malcolm, yeah. OK, uh, just as I suspected, Sam, uh, You've raised a lot of questions there. Thanks for opening that can of worms. Uh, <laughs> Welcome. And I think, yes, we, we the, our best way to educate is, is the staff on the wards. But speaking to them, there's a lot of times they don't know the differences of the blood that's necessary, uh, the KNEG, CalNEG and things. So we need to start with them before we can even think about educating the patient. Uh, so there's a big drive needed. And the, the, obviously the patient's so wrapped up with the problem they've had and the uh, body dysmorphia they've suffered, that anything else will be secondary to them, but they're gonna need to face up uh, to their own challenge if they want more children, make sure they get the right blood products. Sorry, there's loads with the up. 
Yeah, absolutely right. And I think as well, we need to understand that patients who have gone um, sex and uh, gender reassignment, they are traumatised. The, the trauma associated with this process and, the, you know, the, the, the previous life that they've had, it's, you know, they very often have a lot of anxiety and a lot of depression anyway. And then to kind of lumber them with, with all this extra information can be overpowering. So we do need to educate nurses and doctors. And I think us as TPs, we need to make sure that we're tailoring our presentations now to include more of this information. I think perhaps some of us stick in and to blame as well. You know, it's a little afterthought. Oh, I'll stick a slide in about transgender just to, as a nod. We can't just do that. It's not just about sticking it in to look like we're doing something. It's a really meaningful conversation that we have to have. It's not a small topic. You know, we, we, we've we included Jehovah's Witness in, in information for a long time, but actually, probably we've got more patients whose gender is different to the sex signed at birth. And we have Jehovah's Witnesses now and we're not including them and giving inclusive mm -hmm. care as much as we could. Someone asked me, is there a platform to share work done by others on the subject? I work with Scottish National Blood Transfusion Services. We've researched engaged by Trans Scotland, legal at EDF. Would we'll be good to share. I absolutely agree. I'd love to share work done. So it's not just duplicated yet. We're working on a process using current limbs functionality. <laughs> um, have drafted yeah, patient information leaflets and are working with limbs providers for a long term solution. Well, you've made more progress than me, um, our limbs provider, because it's quite an old system. They don't think they're going to make any changes to it because it's not worth putting the work in when it's not going to be used long term. It's hard. It's hard. But I absolutely agree. We need to. I think we need a transfusion platform for this. Um, so we are sharing our thoughts. And also we need some kind of um, national answer because we all want to be doing the same thing and using the same consent process and, and same guidelines rather than just local policies yeah. amazing sam thank you so much we've had some um some really great comments there in the chat it's such a thought-provoking presentation i think we can all tell from the discussion and the the comments that we all found it a really interesting hour and left us with lots of food for thought uh, just a recap for members that um, our next meeting is the 31st of May at 2 p.m. Uh, reminder for all of those that have registered already, you don't need to register again. You'll automatically receive the BMS EDG updates. Um, huge thanks again, Sam, for, for all your know-how and for taking the time to, to talk to us this afternoon. And huge thanks to all of our attendees. Um, to all of those that have signed up to the BMS EDG, the evaluation links were sent along with the invitations and they can also be accessed through the QR code that's on screen at the moment and I'll also pop it in the chat. Uh, these evaluations will trigger certificates sent in the coming weeks uh, just for CPD profiles and uh, the talk will be made available in the coming weeks on YouTube as well.